Hello, BC Calculus friends. I thought it would be good to go over the answers to these free response questions that I gave you this week uh, and just kind of talk about the test a little. Um, I picked 2012 because it was the first one that I found on my computer. <laughs> and uh, I scrolled to questions three and four because these are the first two questions where you do not get a calculator. Not sure how the exam is going to be structured this year as far as calculator or not, but... Um, I thought there's definitely going to be problems where you don't have a calculator. It's probably more likely you don't have a calculator than you do have a calculator. But well, what do I know? I don't know nothing. Um, on the test, historically, you are very often going to see a graph question like number three here and a table question like number four. Uh, obviously, on this test, both were there. Uh, will it be this way when they only give you three questions? I don't know. Maybe they'll have... Part A and a Part B with a graph and a Part C and a Part D with a table, trying to mix it all together. Um, I don't know, but what you see here in question one or question three uh, is the graph of F. And see, what you have to pay attention to is the fact that they show you the graph of F, but then they define function G as the integral of F. So that is a very, very, very common thing to do uh, you know, on the AP exam as well is to define functions in terms of other functions. So you had to kind of get past that. And, and just when they ask you to find g of 2 in part a, you know, that's going back to algebra 2, you know what that means. That means plug 2 in for x. So g of 2 <clears throat> means I'm going to integrate from 1 to 2 because 1 to x is the function g of x, right? So when you integrate from 1 to 2 f of t dt at this point, you know, you go back to what you know about integrals and think, oh, okay, I integrate from 1 to 2. That means the area under the curve of f. And they gave you the curve of F. They gave you the graph. So the area under the curve turns out to be more like the area above the curve because from 1 to 2, the graph of F is below the x-axis. So right away, you should think my answer is going to be negative. Uh, again, it's not asking you for the area. If it was area, then you'd want to make it positive. But it, since it's saying just the definite integral from 1 to 2, the answer can be negative. So, and that is a triangular region. So you have 1 half base times height. One half there in red is because of, uh, you know, triangle. The base is the width from one to two, and the height is that negative one half distance, you know, that the graph is below the x axis. So negative one fourth is the value of g of two. Uh, g of negative two, I tried to redraw it here, snip the graph, uh, is the integral from one to negative two. And you can integrate from 1 to negative 2, but you're going backwards. So when you go backwards, you have to know, oh, that's just going to make my answer the opposite of what I get. So if you find the integral from negative, one, negative 2 to 1, then you have to make it the opposite. Or if you read from 1 to negative 2 backwards, then you have to make the answer the opposite. So formally, we can write that as the negative integral from 1 to 2, from negative 2 to 1, as opposed to the positive integral from 1 to negative 2. Right, so those two things are the same. So the negative integral from negative 2 to 1, you see down here with the, the purple and the, the green uh, picture. Um, from negative 2 to negative 1, you have that green triangle. The green triangle has a height of 3 and a width of 1 because negative 2 to negative 1 is 1. So it's 1 half base times height again right here. 1 half base times height. And then you have... The semicircle, and the semicircle is, um, I think they tell you in the very beginning it's a semicircle, maybe. Yeah, a semicircle centered at the origin. They tell you that in the directions at the top, so you do know it is a semicircle. Um, Got to be careful about some of those kind of things, but the uh, circle has an area of pi r squared, right? but it's only half of it. So because it's below the x-axis, you have a negative. Because it's only a semicircle, you have a half, and then pi r squared is, you know, pi in this case because r is 1. Uh, but then the minus in front basically distributes to both of those. So it's negative 3 halves plus pi over 2 or pi over 2 minus 3 over 2 or I wrote it as pi minus 3 all over 2 with common denominator. So uh, right there the answer is for, for part A. It's just ge it's geometry, right? Calculating area like you did in geometry. Uh, for part B, Again, I tried to sort of go through and redraw the graphs here, so one answer at a time. For each of g prime of negative 3 and g prime prime of negative 3, 
find the value or state that it doesn't exist. Okay, so at this point, you were told already that g of x is the integral of f of x. So when you find g prime, again, write out what that means. You notice here I wrote out g prime of x equals the derivative of g of x, right? That's what g prime means, derivative of g of x. And you know the g of x is the integral from 1 to x. So the derivative of the integral of 1 to x just becomes f of x. That's our second fundamental theorem of calculus right there. It's f of x. So when you're asked to find g prime of x, that, that means you're finding f of x. And f of x, you have the graph of it. So g prime of negative 3 is the same thing as f of negative 3, right? Which means what is the y value on the graph when x is negative 3? So that's over there at the point, you got to figure that out, that it's at 2. But it's pretty simple to figure it out. You have a line segment from, from negative 4 to 1. So it has a slope of, you know, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. So you're at negative 3, comma 2. So f of negative 3 is 2. What does the second derivative mean, right? g prime prime means the derivative of f, f prime. And if g prime of x was f of x, then g prime of prime prime of x is f prime of x, which means the slope. So the second derivative of g at negative 3 is the same as the slope of the function, the slope of that line segment right there. As we just said, the slope of the line segment is 1. Do I really need to write all that out? I don't really need to write that, but I just did, you know, kind of reinforce it. Uh, but again, the whole point here is thinking about, you know, um, defining functions in terms of other functions. So g of x is the integral of f. That means g prime is f. That means g prime prime is f prime. And this is a very common AP exam kind of trickery. You know, it's not straightforward. Notice they never even told us what the function of f is or the function of g. They gave us a graph of f. We could figure it out. It's a piecewise function and all that. But um, this is very different than just like, you know, in Dr. Larson's book, you had uh, 20 questions. What's the derivative of the function? And you practice the rules of derivatives. Uh, we're not needing any of those rules here at all. Uh, and then C. Okay, part C, getting uh, pretty exciting. Find the x-coordinate of each point at which the graph of G has a horizontal tangent line. Okay, so horizontal tangent line means the slope is zero. The slope of the tangent lines is zero. Now, the tricky thing is when you look at the graph of f, you might think, oh, it, it only has a slope of zero at one place, but we're not talking about f having a horizontal tangent line. We're talking about g. g has a horizontal tangent line. Remember, g is the integral of f, right? <laughs> so g is horizontal when the derivative of g is equal to zero or when f of x equals zero. So again, how do you find minimums, maximums? You set the derivative equal to zero or you look for when the derivative doesn't exist. In this case, it's talking about just horizontal tangent lines. Um, and g is horizontal when its derivative is equal to zero. So the derivative not existing is then a thing to worry about here. When is the derivative of g equal to zero? The derivative of g equals zero when f is equal to zero. When f equals zero, is on the graph. So f of x is equal to 0 at negative 1 and 1. Then it asks you to determine whether there's a minimum and maximum or neither at these horizontal tangent lines. And so again, minimums occur when the slope of the graph goes from negative to positive because the graph's going down and then it's going up. That was our ink and dink tables from forever ago. Uh, Maximums occur when the slope of the graph changes from positive to negative, right? The graph changes from increasing to decreasing. So at negative 1, it goes from a positive to a negative. How's that? How do you know that? So at negative 1 right here, notice above the graph, that's where slope is positive. F is positive above the axis, right? Because that's the graph of F. Above the x-axis is where F is positive. So and remember, F is the same thing as G prime. So the slope is positive above the x-axis of g, the slope of g is negative below the x-axis. So at negative 1, the graph changes from a positive slope to negative slope. That's how you know it's a maximum. At x equals 1, there's no sign change, right? Notice how the graph is below the x-axis on the left, and then it's below the x-axis again on the right. So there's neither a min or a max at, at 
x equals 1. So I'm using Screencast-O-Matic to make this recording, and you only can do this for 15 minutes. And we just hit the 10-minute mark. 10 minutes of your life have disappeared. <laughs> um, so i got to hurry here, right? Part D, find all the values for x at which the graph g has an inflection point. Okay, how do you get inflection points? Okay, so inflection points, the critical numbers, right? Critical values occur when the derivative, in this case, second derivative is equal to zero, or when it doesn't exist, right? So when does the second derivative equal zero? That happens when the first derivative is zero. When does the second derivative not exist? For g, that's when the first derivative of f does not exist. And so looking back at the graph of f at the top, uh, at zero, I didn't really copy the whole graph here. Uh, at zero, notice the the slope of the tangent line would be zero. Okay, so that's where the derivative is zero. At negative two, the derivative of f does not exist because it's a a sharp corner, and at positive one, the derivative does not exist because it's a sharp corner. So there's two places where the derivative of f, right? f prime doesn't exist at those two places and f prime is zero at that one place which is the same question or the same thing as g prime prime right um i zoomed way too much sorry so f prime prime g prime prime is equal to zero or f prime is equal to zero occurs at x equals zero. G prime prime doesn't exist, or the derivative of f doesn't exist where the sharp corners in the graph are, which is negative two and one. So all three values end up being inflection points because on the left side of each, you do have a change of, uh, of slope, right? The slope at negative two goes from positive to negative. So that means there's a change in the second derivative or a change in concavity. At zero, it goes from negative to positive, change of concavity. And then at one, the graph goes from positive to negative. So it's a change of concavity. So if you think about the graph. Um, so all three of those values are places where you have inflection points. So I think I might wait on question four since I've got like two minutes left and just kind of reflect on all of this. Um, again, part D, points of inflection require you to think about where the slope is zero and where the slope doesn't exist, right? Um, in, in part C, they just asked about horizontal tangent line. So horizontal tangent line is not going to happen when the derivative doesn't exist, right? So you just have to look at the part where the derivative is equal to zero, right? Or where F is equal to zero. Um, kind of slightly two different questions. Obviously one was in terms of concavity and one was in terms of, you know, extrema, but, um, similar concept in both so that one question dealing with the graph uh four parts 15 minutes that's kind of what they give you uh you know on average for a free response question try to zoom out so you can see all of it at one time <laughs> I, I answered the first two parts of question four uh, down below and i'll just make a separate video for that right now um but but there's all of that question with the graph okay any questions please raise your hand hmm i don't see any hands raised okay um I'll talk to you guys in a minute. Bye.